Living Church, thank you for joining us tonight. And those online, thank you for viewing. Um, I just want to invite everybody to stand up and to get in your best worship position as we get into this time of song and praise. Let's prepare our hearts before we get into this time of worship. Dear Lord God, we just ask that this night, Lord, that you would intervene, God, that you would fill our hearts with, with joy, God, with satisfaction. And Lord, that we would just pull in closer to you, God, as we sing your rightful praise, Lord, as we shout out your name, Lord, with joy. And again, God, you are so worthy of our praise, Lord. And as your children, God, we obediently, Lord, we obediently sing your praise and your glory, God, because you have blessed us beyond measure, Lord. You have given us the ultimate present, God, your son, Lord. So we praise you, God. We praise you, Abba, for everything that you do in our lives, Lord, and for everything that you continue to do in our lives, God. As you use us, Lord, for your glory, God, and only for your glory, Lord. And so we pray, God, that this time of worship would be pleasing to your heart, God, as we seek your face, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.
I can just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I can just stay, I can just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something. Hold on. 
Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Thank you, Jesus, for paying it all on the cross, God. Thank you, Lord. So, uh, words are so powerful, but they're more powerful when you mean it. And so when we sang, Jesus paid it all, I pray that we really mean that. For all he has done on that cross for us, God, even before that, for all the suffering he suffered before the cross, willingly, you know, in the book of Luke, I remember reading how he, he, he sweated blood, crying to his, his father, asking to take this cup from him. And he knows it was not his will, but the Lord's will, God's will, his father's will. For what he had to do had to be done. That's paying for it. Paying for it with his life. His sinless life. He didn't deserve it. We deserve death, but we're born sinners. He was perfect, and that perfection paid it all. So I, I pray that you really feel that, understand what that means, because if you do, your life would be different. I know I'm not perfect, but I started thinking about that and how this sinless God came, God came down, I mean, literally came down, and died for me, from perfection to sinful destruction in every way you see it. And he came to die for you too. So these songs, these words that we sing are so much more than simple words. And I pray that you see that and hear that and feel that and know that now. That you're worshiping a God who loves you so much that he died for you. And 
uh, I, I know how that feels as a, my, myself as a father. I would die for my daughter. I would take a bullet, jump in front of a car without thought. And Jesus did that for us. He died on the cross for us. So thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for those who are watching online, those who are brave enough to come out. Thank you, Father, for those. Bless them, Lord. Give them strength to continue on being a line of witness to those around them, Father. It's so much easier to step away, especially when you're online. So much distraction. So I pray that they, they can hold down with you, Father. If they have to go into their car to escape everything around them, go into a closet, do something to, to spend that time with you and your word, Father. And as Pastor Reuben comes up, or I'm sorry, Pastor Randy comes up today, tonight, to share your word, Father, that they hear that word and they, they're touched fully by you, God, and they're transformed within, God, anywhere they're at. For you're not contained by walls, Lord, but I pray that they're just not distracted. So thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we just thank you and we praise you in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus Christ. And we all say, amen. Amen. Let's all welcome one another. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. Glad to have you here tonight. So wonderful to see everyone on a Wednesday night. All of you that are watching online, thank you for joining us. A couple of announcements before we get started here. I'd like to share with you our Christmas celebration is coming up this coming Sunday, December 20th. We will be having heavenly tacos for Christmas. So Come on out and join us. There's about uh, 75 that will be there. So we're hoping to just have a great time of fellowship and remember the birth of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, we will have our Christmas service on the 25th at 9 a.m. here at the church. So please invite, invite, and then invite uh, others to come on out. Um, yeah, how important it is to invite, right? God, uh, God saved me from the bottom of the barrel. And if he saved me from the bottom of the barrel, the scum of the earth, how much more should we go out and reach those at the bottom of the barrel that need Jesus? I don't know if you saw my video uh, this p past week by Sandy Adams, but he gave a, gave a great analogy of that. Did anyone see that one about how a guy lost his keys? Well, he was eating ribs <laughs> and all that messy, ribby stuff all over the papers, towels and spit and sauce and everything, and threw, threw everything into the trash can and went out to his car and he lost his keys, couldn't find them. Then he realized he put it on the, sh uh, on the um, plate tray, and so he knew they were at the bottom of the barrel. And he had to reach his hand in there and get those keys out at the bottom of the barrel. And then he makes... A profound statement and said that's exactly what Jesus did for us 
went to the bottom of the barrel to get us out. So uh, we should be going to the bottom of the barrel in reaching people for Jesus Christ. So let's take that opportunity because the world has no hope right now with what's going on and people are losing hope so we can share with them the love of Jesus Christ. So um, tonight uh, we have our pastor Randy uh, sharing with us and he will be sharing from Philippians uh, tonight. So we want to welcome him to uh, minister to us uh, as the Lord leads him in his study. So thank you again for, for joining us tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone. How are we doing tonight? A little cold, a whole lot of blessed. Uh, kind of bear with me. The uh, Our Lord and our, our Savior, he always wants to keep us um, doing things different. So instead of doing my normal sharing through a paper, which I usually take my notes on papers, he has me an iPad now. So modern technology, everything we get to learn. Okay. Well, let's pray. Gracious Father, as we humbly come before you, Lord, we just want to lift up tonight unto you, Lord. Father, empty me out, Lord. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, as this message here, Father, is from you to whoever out there, Lord, needs to hear it. I pray, Father, that hearts are open, minds are open, ears are open, Father, to you and to your word tonight, Lord. That, Father, that you would minister to somebody, more than one, hopefully, Father, and that you would touch them, Lord, through this, uh, this message, Lord. And let your spirit, Father, just bless and be blessed, Father. We thank you, Lord, for tonight as we lift this up to you, that you be glorified in Jesus' name. Okay, um, as Pastor Reuben said, we will be in the book of Philippians. The theme for tonight will be joy of the Lord. So <clears throat> go ahead and open your Bibles up. We'll be reading from chapters 1 through chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Okay, let's go ahead and start. The theme of the, uh, the apostles to the Philippians is joy. Specifically, the joy of serving God. This may seem strange because of Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. This was the original origin of Paul's joy. He saw God working through the difficult situations he faced. <clears throat> Another theme of Paul's letters is partnership in the gospel. Paul uses the Greek word koinonoa in this letter in various ways. Fellowship, partakers, and shared. Now, all of these passages highlight the Philippians' activity, active involvement in Paul's own ministry. By supporting Paul, the Philippians had become partakers with him to further the gospel of the news of Jesus Christ. Paul illustrates this concept of partnering and fellowship with the life of Jesus Christ and Timothy. Since the Philippian Christians already possess the great joy and has demonstrated their partnership in sharing the gospel, Paul took the opportunity to identify a few weak areas that could be improved. For example, fellowship has two components. One is love. The other one is discernment. The Philippians have expressed the former, but lacking the latter. Thus, Paul exhorted the Philippians to grow in knowledge and in discernment. Words that in the Greek refer to rational understanding. In other words, the Greek words for acknowledgement focuses on the person to God relationship. As for the Greek word for discernment, it points to the person to person relationship. Paul wanted the Philippians not only to, to abound in love, 
but also to experience more of God so that they would grow into a mature understanding of his ways. All this shows that Paul had more than one purpose for this letter to the Philippians. Okay, in the context, let's look at the context. Paul, the apostle, was arrested in Jerusalem, held in a prison in Caesarea for two years until he appealed to Caesar for his case in Rome. While Paul was in Rome for two years awaiting his presence before Caesar, he was under house arrest. 24 hours a day. Can you imagine being under arrest for 24 hours a day? He was chained to a Roman guard. Now, I, I've never had shackles on my legs, but I'll tell you right now, I bet you they hurt. 24 hours a day walking around that thing, plus attached to a guard. What's up, dude? How's it going? Really? So, being chained 24 hours a day, there were 10,000 elite soldiers in Rome who had been appointed as imperial guards and whose chief duty, their main duty, was to protect the emperor. One of these men were chained to Paul on shifts all day long. Paul saw that as a great opportunity to witness because they, well, they couldn't get away. Stuck with them all day long. I was kind of wondering... Was that guard like, dude, do you never stop talking about the Lord? Nope. <laughs> and as a result Paul, of Paul's witnessing to these men, many of them were brought to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It, is a, it was quite a, re a revival there in Rome while Paul was awaiting his appearance before Caesar. The church in Philippi took up a great offering for him and sent him a, a very generous offering. It was brought, it was brought, to, brought to Paul by Ephrodius, who on, that, uh, who on the way to see Paul became very ill and almost died. But he brought to Paul this gift from the hearts of those in Philippi. That is a loving church, brothers and sisters. I mean, that, those people loved him so much, they even took care of him, paid for his bills, and even when he was in prison, kicked in cash. And that's pretty sweet. And basically, this letter that Paul writes to them from the prison in Rome is a letter of thanksgiving and gratitude for the money that they had sent to him by Ephrodius. And so, that was the reason for Paul's writing this epistle. <coughs> it is written not as from apostle to the church, as are most of Paul's epistles, but it was written as a letter from a friend to a friend, and that, my brothers and sisters, is a lot more deeper than a lot of people understand. We love our church, we, we love our brothers and sisters, but when we become family, our brothers and sisters in church and that walk with the Lord, whether we know them or not, they are like a very close friend, and they are family. There is a very warm, friendly feeling through the whole epistle. It is interesting that a tone of, uh, the tone of the epistle is one of extreme joy and rejoicing. Which is interesting in the fact that during that time, Paul was doing all his rejoicing. He was chained to a Roman guard in a Roman prison. Some of you may have heard of or visited the Mamertine prison in Rome, where tradition says Paul is hel was held. <coughs> it, is in, it isn't a very attractive place. It is underground, and the light comes from a window up above. But yet, Paul always had the light within him. And thus, as he declares, I have learned in whatever state I am in, to be to be content. I know how to. <coughs> I know how to abound, and I know how to abase. I am content because my contentment does not lie in my circumstances. My contentment lies in the relationship with Jesus Christ, and that cannot change. My circumstances may change. I may. 
be in tough physical circumstances. But my contentment isn't in that. My contentment is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> and it is important that we also learn to find our contentment in Jesus Christ. Because when we learn whatever our contentment is, we can be content in it. So Paul opens this epistle, and along with the little letter to Philemon in 1 Thessalonians, it's the only epistle where he does not begin by affirming his apostleship. <coughs> Usually, it is Paul, an apostle by the will of God. But he is writing now as a friend to a friend. And let's look at the outline, a chapter outline. We have salutations in verses 1 through 2. Paul's prayers for the Philippians, and that's in verses 3 through 5. Paul's confidence in Christ and his work, verses 6 through 7. <coughs> Excuse me. Prayer for the Philippians, and that's your, uh, verses 8 through 11. Success in jail, the gospel proclaimed by Paul and others. And that's in verses 12 through 18. Three points for tonight. Our, my first point is greetings, and that'll be in verses 1 through 2. Thankfulness and prayer, and that's in verses 3 through 11. And Christ is preached, and that's verses 12 through 18. <coughs> my first point. Let's we'll go ahead and read the text. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, and to all the saints and Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This letter is specifically directed to those in faith. The word servant here in the Greek is doulos, which is bond slave. Now a bond slave is more than just a servant. A servant was a person who was hired, who had the freedom to if he wanted to, or if he didn't like his job, to quit and to find another <coughs> job someplace, or find another job someplace else. Not so with a bond slave. Like it or not, you are the property of your owner. The servant could come and go as he pleased, not a bond slave. A bond slave was some, something that was for life. So being a bond slave you weren't really your own. You were owned by your, your master. <coughs> and being a bond slave can be actually a pretty good thing. When you're a, a bond slave to Jesus Christ and to our Lord and our Savior, that's the best slave you can ever be. <coughs> now let's take a look at the saints. The definition of a saint is sacred or holy. If you give your life to Jesus Christ as a saint and you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And that's in John chapter 12, verse 26. If you ask Jesus into your heart, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John answered, saying to all I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Now after Jesus' death, we see here as the disciples were hiding from the Jews, <coughs> Jesus' spirit came to them. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. Acts chapter 1 says he gave proof of his resurrection for 40 days. Then he told the disciples to wait. And the Holy Spirit came 10 days later. And then he said, and then he had said this. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And that's in John chapter 20, verse 22. If you love your Lord and Savior, you are his saints. Let's take a look at bishops now. <coughs> Whereas a deacon is 
Let's see. The word deacon is derived from the Greek word dukelos, du dikonos, which is <coughs> a standard ancient word, a ancient Greek word for meaning servant, waiting, man, minister, or messenger. It is generally assumed that the office of a deacon originated in the section of selection of seven men by the apostles, among them Stephen, to assist with the charitable work of the early churches as recorded in Acts chapter 6, verses 1, and two, 1 through 6. Now, in verse 2, you can see how much Paul loves those in Philippi by how he greets them in this letter. Let's look at the word grace. Grace is defined in, many, in the Thayer's Dictionary as good, no, as goodwill, loving kindness, and favor. Now let's look at the definition of peace, a state of national tranquility, exemption from the rage of havoc of war, peace between individuals, Harmony, security, safety, prosperity. Because peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. And the way that leads to peace is salvation. Now let's look at grace. Grace to you and peace. Then Paul gave his familiar greeting of grace and peace, recognizing that these came to us only from God our Father and through the Son, Jesus Christ. Now for my second point. Thanksgiving and prayer. Let's read the text. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you with all joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think, of th to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you, for long for you all with the affections of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without false or without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Verses 3 through 11, Paul tells the Philippians how thankful he is for their fellowship in the gospel and to stay faithful in the Lord is working in their, and stay faithful as the Lord is working in their lives. Paul's heart went out to the Philippians not just because of the love they have for him, but for the love that God is showing to him through the Philippians. Have you ever no have you noticed when you pray, there's a different type of emotions that go with your different type of prayers. If you pray for the lost soul, my heart is concerned for them. If I am praying for people that I am personally attached to, my prayers are more intimate. I thank God for those that the Lord brings into my life. In verse, okay, let's look at verse 3. <clears throat> I thank God for you. I have those brothers and sisters in my life, and so do you, that God has put into your life to help mold and shape you to the person you are today. I thank God he brought them into my life, and you should be thankful God brought them into your life also. Every time Paul remembered the work of God in Philippi, he was thinking, he was thanking God for them. John, in writing this epistle, said, I have no greater joy than to know my children are walking in truth. And that's in John 
Third John chapter 4. I think that can be said of the heart of every minister. The greatest joy that can come to any pastor is to know that those who are really the children in the faith, as the result of their teachings, will come to walk in the truth. We try not to, I don't want to say pride ourselves, or try to point glory because it's the Lord that really works through all of us, not just pastors, teachers, but anybody who's sharing the gospel. And it's, it is such a joy to, to see that somebody got saved through the Lord working through you or through a brother or a sister. It, it's, it's, it makes me want to tear up. It really does. <clears throat> okay, let's look at verses 4 and 5, praying for you. Paul is thanking God praying for them always but there is always a certain joyfulness involved with it because of the work of that god is doing there he is thanking god for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now every day we need to be praying for some everyone at first thessalonians tells us pray without ceasing or as first thessalonians tells us pray without ceasing and that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Yes, Paul did love to see the work of the Lord going out, as we all do. He knew his brothers and sisters out there could use some intercessory prayer. And we all should be praying for our brothers and sisters constantly for their situations, for their troubles, their pains, their aches, even their concerns. Always keep your brothers and sisters in, up in prayer. And I say brothers and sisters because everybody out there from this pulpit, as far as I'm concerned, this pulpit, that way, Facebook, on the streets, to me, everybody is my family. They, you guys are all my brothers and my sisters. So let's look at chapter, or at verse 6, and I classified that under construction. Did you know that every single Christian on the face of this earth has at one time or another felt that they have failed Christ? Each one of us is still under construction. Every day, the Lord is molding us and shaping us. We see this in the story of the potter and the clay. That's in Isaiah chapter uh, 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us, all of us, are the work of your hand. Let me give you a little bit of behind the scenes of your life. God is constantly molding you and shaping you into his image. Think about that every day you wake up. What am I to learn? What's God trying to teach me? What's God trying to show me? Always look for the little tiny things that you never expect. Even when you're being yelled at, you're being taught compassion. Uh, you're being taught how to be humble. There's tons of things to learn from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. God's trying to teach you, mold you, and shape you into being a child of God, to being humble, to being loving and kind. All the attributes that were Jesus, it's in there. He's trying to teach and share with you. On your own times, you can go ahead and read Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. And just remember, you can rest in that fact that, therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, if you let him. And that's in Matthew chapter 5, verses 48. We see in verse 7 the personal nature of this letter. It's really from Paul's heart to them as he just opens up and bears his heart to them and again that oneness that they share together. For they are partakers with Paul of the grace of God, and they are sharing with him who at this point, at this time, is in bonds. He is in prison because of his defense of the gospel. And so they are sharing with him through these various experiences. Let's look at having God as a witness in verse 8. 
we used to say that you can take it to the bank. But having God as your witness is definitely one way that affirms that you are telling the truth. Because when you put God's name in it, there had best not be no deception in what you are saying. Just remember, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But those who deal faithfully are his delight. And that's in Proverbs chapter 12, verses 22. And Paul knows the God who he serves. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. That's in John chapter 4, verse 24. Now the love of God, the, the love of knowing God closer. And that's in verse 9. I've seen a lot of people coming through this ministry. Very few have kept the personal relationship with Jesus Christ when they leave. It is sad to see so many choose a path, a wrong path. For those who, for those of you who have gone astray, these scriptures are for you. But grow in grace and the knowledge of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And that's in Second Peter, verses, Second Peter, verse uh, three. Chapter 3, verse 18. And when your knowledge of Christ grows, people will know that. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. And that's in John chapter 13, verses 35. Yes, the world will see that Christ-like love in you have for one another. Now let's take a look at being sincere and without offense in verse 10. Are you sincere in your walk? Do you really mean what you say and what you believe? This might be a question that Paul is asking the Philippians. When we approve and receive the things that are excellent, we become sincere in speaking of, and speak, we can become sincere. Speaking of the inner righteousness and the outer offense, Speaking of righteousness that can be seen till the day of Christ means that these things become increasingly evident in our life until Jesus comes. Being sincere is important, but alone, but alone isn't. Yeah, but alone is not enough. Notorious sinners in the days of Jesus, such as tax collectors, were sincere. Yet they still needed to repent as well as being without offense before others is important. But alone it is not enough. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were without offense in, these, in, the, in the opinion of many. We want God to make us both sincere and without offense. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. And that's verse 11. Now the fruit of righteousness is love and joy and peace. Paul wanted them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Filled with the joy of Christ. And filled with the peace. The peace that only Jesus can give us. Filled with the love of Christ. Bearing fruit is always the result of abiding in, Je in Jesus and that's in John chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. As we abide in him, we receive the life and nutrients we need to naturally bear fruit in the glory and praise of God. And my third point for tonight, and that will be in verses 12 through 18. Let's go ahead and read the text. <clears throat> now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment in, in, in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole patern paternium guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some to be sure are preaching Christ from, from envy and strife, 
but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambitions, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause my distress. Let me see. Yeah. Thinking to cause my distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in, in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Now, being in jail, you don't get a lot of chance to go very far. But it does make a nice area to preach the gospel. I understand what Paul is going through to hear that the word of Christ is going out and being shared and preached. It makes my heart to know that people are being saved. But most of all, that Christ is being shared throughout the world. Now in verse 12, it says, The things which, are, which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. The Lord can use any situation, all situations we're in, whether in jail, whether homeless, whether rich and wealthy. Every situation out there, the Lord can use that to furtherance the gospel. And here, he happened to use Paul in prison. Uh, Paul answered here a concern for the Philippians. He wanted them to know that God's blessing and power were still with him, even though he was in prison. He was not out of the will of God, and God's work still continued. When Jesus told his disciples to go out and preach the gospel to all the world, and that's in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he didn't specifically, he didn't specify what you would be going through. No matter what your situation, you should always be sharing God's word. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And that's in Acts chapter 8, verses 4. Paul knew no matter where he was, he just stayed faithful, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to love Paul. It didn't matter where he was. He would share the gospel with everyone. What better place to share the gospel than, to, than with a captive audience in jail? The circumstances around Paul's imprisonment and his manner in which the mit in the manner and the midst of it made it clear to all observers that he was not just another prisoner, but that he was an ambassador of Jesus Christ. This witness led to the conversion of many, even some of the palace guards. Did you know that our trials are someone else's inspiration? When you are rooted and so deeply in love with Jesus Christ and God our Father, People see that fruit, and it encourages them as they go through their struggles in life to stay faithful. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, it says, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because of the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Lord, through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. And even when we inspire others, some people out of there, some people out there become jealous. As we see in verse 15, it says some to be pure, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also of goodwill. There were those who were jealous of Paul's ministry and what God was doing through Paul. They thought to take advantage of the fact that he was in bonds. They are going to go out and they are going to try to do their own work out of their contentions or strife. Their motive was rivalry, which is competition. They are competing against Paul, building up their own little flocks, their own motives, where they were they really wrong in what they were doing. But it 
But the very fact that they were doing it, Paul rejoiced. Now let's look at two words, envy and strife. Now the word envy defined is a feeling of discontent or covetousness with regards to another's advantages, success or possessions. Now strife is defined as competition or rivalry. When you're a Christian, you should not, you should be doing nothing of selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Always be very cautious of false teachers. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men <coughs> are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth, flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And that's in Romans chapter 16, verses 18, or 17 through 18. Now let's look at 15b. But some also of goodwill. In the Thayer's Dictionary, good is defined as kindly, intent, delightful pleasure, satisfaction, and desire. It is more than a love for Jesus Christ. It is a life-changing. You can help, but you can't share the gospel with those that you come across in your day-to-day -day life. Let's look at verse 16. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The great desire of every true Christian is that Christ may be magnified and glorified, that his name may be made great, and God's kingdom glorified. Now the former claims, verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambitions rather than from pure. Motives thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Did you know that they want Paul to endure the humiliation of having to admit that others were more effective than him? They didn't understand that Paul honestly didn't care about this because he did not have a competitive spirit in ministry. He just wanted to share Christ with everyone. And in verse 18, <clears throat> let's look at the first thing it says is, he says is what then? Which cracked me up when he said that. What then? Now what? What are you guys getting out of this? Now the definition of what then is what has happened in this case. It's like Paul is saying in verse 18, after these guys decide to do what they are going to do, what do they really think they're going to accomplish? Paul's real concern is that Christ was being proclaimed throughout the world. John said to him, Jesus, no, he said to him, the him is Jesus, teacher, we saw someone <coughs> casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not hinder him. For there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be, able, and be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. And that's in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 40. Remember that Paul's concern here is not with the content of the gospel being preached. Only with the motives of those who preached. Paul objected if the if he thought a false or distort, distorted gospel was being preached, even if the best of motives, and that's in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul's attitude went like this. If you preach the true gospel, I don't care what your motives are. If your motives are bad, God will deal with you. But at least the gospel is being preached. But if you preach a false gospel, I don't care how good your motives are, 
you are dangerous unless we stop pre- unless we stop preaching your false gospel and god motive got good motives don't excuse your false message <clears throat> In closing, Paul is trying to encourage the Philippian church, which is family to him, to always be remembering, to always, yeah, to, to always be remembering the good times they had together, no matter where they're at. In verse four, to always be joyful, praying for each other. In verse seven, a love that Paul has for them, for them is an unbreakable godly love, a love that we should all have for our brothers and sisters also. We should all be praying and encouraging the the growth and the righteous fruit of our brothers and sisters. Verse 12 through 17 encourages the Philippians to also, and also should be encouraging us to not worry about the circumstances or who is listening. We should be sharing the word everybody because we don't know who God brought in our lives amidst to hear that word or encouragement. Now if any of if any of this message has ministered to your heart, have you been more focused on going on the things going on in your life or maybe you walked away from the Lord and didn't realize it? Maybe you need to get right with Jesus. This is your walk with, you know, is your walk with Jesus weak? And are you uncommitted? Maybe you need to get right with with Jesus. If you have not come to a personal relationship with Jesus, then you have no relationship with God at all. It is only through Jesus Christ that one can access to the Father in heaven. That's in John chapter 6, verse 44. And if anyone comes to Christ in faith after repentance, then Jesus says to them, I will raise him up on that last day. The last day will be either joining Christ in heaven or in the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of heaven (coughs) everywhere or everywhere being separated from him with no second chance. And that's in Revelations chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, as I lift my brothers and sisters up to you, Father, my church family, which I love so dearly, Lord, and the world out there, Father, who who needs you, Lord, who seems to be walking away from you, Lord. I pray, Father, that your spirit ministers to each and every person out there, Lord, Father, I pray, Lord, that they come into a a working knowledge of you, Lord, in their hearts and their mind. Open a way, Father, as you will, Lord, because you don't want not one to perish, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying upon the cross for our soul and our sins, for being a light and being an example to us. And we thank you, Father, for your word which gives us life and direction. Father, I pray, Lord, that your word never stops going out. And I pray, Father, that ears never turn closed to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.